Welcome to Helicon West. Welcome home. It's great to be back in the Logan Library where Helicon West started almost 20 years ago. I'm Pam Loosley. I'm the MC this evening. Thank you all for being here. Helicon West is an uncensored public reading series. We regularly host published authors alongside community writers to promote and support all levels of skill, ability, and craft. If you would like to read during the open mic, you can sign up on the sheet next to the coffee service. If you'd like to donate or help keep Helicon West going, we have bookmarks on the coffee table that have a QR code link. We acknowledge that Helicon West operates on the territory of the North, Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Our events are made possible with the support from Sugar House Review, the Logan Library, the USU English Department, and com community volunteers. For a full acknowledgement statement, interviews with featured readers, merchandise, and much more, visit heliconwest.wordpress.com. I'm the featured reader tonight, and I will be followed by my creative writing group. Our group is called Writers Cafe. We have been writing together creatively for over 10 years. And when we started, we just all wanted to write creatively and learn to write better. Uh, several of us are writing about our own lives and interesting stories that we've lived through. We've kept going for 10 years through COVID. We had to do Zoom and whatever else. We've kept ourselves going. And uh, Star wanted to spotlight our group tonight because we've been going for a long time. And our group is, we have eight members. We're a closed group, not accepting any new members. But if anybody would like to start a writing group or be interested in joining a group, talk to me after this or at the next Helicon West and we'll see if we can get another group going. Our group is just great to support each other, give each other positive feedback listen to what we've written and we just enjoy all different kinds of writing we've written from different prompts we've written poetry many of us in the group are not yet published but we do have a small book of haiku that we're working on getting published so maybe the next time we come we'll have that anyone um anyone is welcome to coffee in the back and um, let's see. I'm going to start with a story that I wrote. It's about my mom, and it's an interesting thing that happened to her when she was a young girl. People looked at her differently after hearing that she'd survived being hit by lightning. It was a mixture of emotions, awe, respect, and reverence. I was eight years old when I first heard her tell her story at our church, and everyone in the room was captivated because no one had ever told a story like hers. My mom, Sandy Smith, was 13 years old in the summer of 1951 when their church girls, camp, church girls group planned a camping trip to Darby Campground. The young boys had their own campground and they had just purchased an area called Darby Campground for the girls. It settled the Idaho and Wyoming borders in the Grand Targhee National Forest. Beautiful, rugged acres. But after the lightning strike, leaders wondered if they should keep that campground or sell it because girls had died there. Sandy and her friends, Sandy Hancock and Gwen Albright, walked together to the church to meet to go to camp. They had their sleeping bags, they were ready to go. They lived close by and they walked to church and school and different social events together. Sandy Smith and Sandy Hancock hung out quite a bit and their parents called them the two Sandys. About 150 young girls and six leaders met at the church to drive almost two hours to the Darby campground. One of the leaders that came with them, Fred Miller, was a regional Boy Scout leader. And he had a lot of knowledge of that area and the outdoors, camping, and he had a lot of first aid skill. It's because of him and one other leader who just happened to be a nurse that there were only five deaths that day and not 30 or 40. 
Darby was beautiful and serene and quiet, except for 150 teenage girls setting up camp that day. They were enjoying the spacious skies, the tall trees, all the different flowers that Mr. Miller knew the names of. What's not to enjoy when you're hiking through beautiful trails leading to alpine meadows and cool mountain streams? Camping and hiking here helped you feel the balance between all things in God's world. It was beauty and love surrounding you. This forged a beginning of trust in God's world and the building of confidence in yourself as a young woman. Day two, August 1st was the hike and the girls woke up so excited. Mr. Miller led the way. It was almost two miles up the rugged mountains to the wind caves. He made the hike interesting by pointing out different names of plants and flowers. It was a perfect summer day for a hike. But up in the mountains, the weather can change suddenly and drastically. And it did, just when they were coming out of the wind caves, getting ready to have their lunch. The rain started slowly, slowly, then it started to hail, and then heavy rain. Lightning hit the rim just above them. The group was in a clearing in a meadow surrounded by trees getting ready to have their lunch. And one leader sat down and leaned up against a tree. Mr. Miller was just ushering the last few girls out of the wind caves and he yelled at her to move and move now. Being under a tree is not safe at all in a storm. Mrs. Holst looked around at the other trees and thought, these trees have been here for hundreds of storms and she chose not to move. Suddenly, crack and boom, lightning struck that tree, killing Mrs. Holst immediately. And then another lightning strike, just as loud and just as close. The lightning had sheared through a large branch, almost all the way through. Girls were screaming. Some were thrown into the air, landing yards away. Several were thrashing on the ground, suffering burns to their body, their hair on fire. Fred Miller and Nurse Richmond had also been hit and thrown feet into the air, but they jumped right up and got into medical mode, starting the artificial respiration on the girls that were injured many of them in unconscious. As they would do this artificial respiration technique on a girl, when she would revive, they would then teach her the technique and she would work on the girl next to her. They kept this up, working on all of the injured girls. Some of the girls would slip back into unconsciousness and so they'd have to be revived multiple times. They were given a hard candy to help them to stay awake. The two Sandys had been hit as well, as they sat on the ground about 20 feet from that tree. Lightning had traveled through the ground, and people may not know that, but it's just as dangerous through the ground as in the air. Sandy was hit on the back of her leg through her new Levi's. They, she would bear a scar for life, but the internal and other side effects weren't known for decades. The sensations Sandy felt on this day would remain with her and if you asked her about it, she remembers it like it was yesterday. Years and decades didn't change the feelings of coming so close to death. The sights of fire and smoke coming from the girl's hair, the rain drenching everything, lunch sacks smoldering, all of them screaming, praying, crying. The noise of the two separate strikes coming just seconds apart and the trio trying to break free. Mr. Miller yelling instructions for the girls to help each other. The atrocious smell in the air of burnt flesh and skin and hair. The girls, the electricity in the meadow from the impact sparking the mass confusion among the girls. Fear, panic, a sense of dread and hopelessness. Being dazed after the hit and living through it, but not knowing what was next. More lightning, being able to get out of there safely, having to leave a friend or sister behind. There were so many feelings and sensations bombarding these young girls all at once. Both Sandys had been hit, but their friend Gwen had been knocked unconscious. She lay numb on the grass, staring off into space, 
oblivious to the fact that there was a blade of grass right on her eye. Sandy was crying and trembling as she tried to move the blade of grass, and Sandy Hancock tried too, but they couldn't, and Gwen just kept staring without blinking. It was surreal, but very, very much real. The branch that was sheared almost all the way through wouldn't fall for several days after. Had it fallen after the lightning strike, could have crushed and killed 20 girls. Mr. Miller's efforts to move them had helped save them. He could see that they were in a really bad way and Mother Nature was not helping at all. So he asked for volunteers to hike back down the mountain almost two miles and let the base camp know leaders there would need to get help from the next town. The two Sandys were two of the five girls who volunteered. The rain was still intense as the five girls struggled to stay on the muddy path. One girl suggested they stop and pray, so they did. They prayed for guidance down the mountain and to be safe, not panic, and not get hit by more lightning. They prayed for the physical strength to get help for the rest of their group and they prayed for internal strength that they did not yet feel. As they continued to slip down the path, the rain lightened and then stopped. When those leaders in the camp saw just five girls coming back, they ran to them and heard about the tragedy. Leaders drove to Driggs, Idaho and asked for help from local ranchers and farmers. Mr. Miller and Nurse Richmond were able to save all but five girls and the one leader and they could see by their burns and injuries that they were beyond help. The school buses from Driggs came and bused the girls back to a church in Driggs. In 1951, the radio carried the news back to Idaho Falls and the accident was reported and the deaths, but there was no mention of names. Sandy's family and all the girls' family had no idea if she would be among one of the survivors or if she would be one that would have to be carried out on horseback in this rugged terrain. And in 51, the only way to bring those bodies off the mountain was on horseback. As the group was leaving, one lone girl came walking down the path. Her clothes were burned, her hair was singed, but she was alive walking down the path. Her sister was still crying because they'd had to leave her for dead, trying, to mul trying multiple times to revive her. In her own words, she said, when she came to consciousness, she looked around and saw she was surrounded by burned bodies and assumed she herself was dead. But then she quickly realized she was not and she needed to get out of there quickly. Families met at the church in Driggs to see if their girls were okay. Somehow the women in Driggs had made a lunch of hot soup and sandwiches for the girls while they were waiting for their families to arrive. They could have something to eat finally and try and get warm. All the parents had been in a state of shock, not knowing if their daughter would be one of the ones who was a survivor. Mr. and Mrs. Hancock cried tears of joy when they saw their two Sandys in the church. They sped back to Idaho Falls with both girls. That night at home, a cousin had come to stay over, and there wasn't enough room, so Sandy had to sleep on the couch in the living room. And that night it started to storm, and the thunder and lightning were just terrifying her. Her mother came and laid by her and tried to comfort her. She was allowed to stay in bed the next day, but after that, her life got back to normal. Part of her life got back to normal. The other part, she tried to ignore. The part that wondered why they had been hit and why some had been spared and some not. Would she ever heal completely? Would she trust enough to go in the outdoors and go camping again? These were some pretty deep questions and Sandy didn't know the answers. So she chose to not worry about the questions and just live her life and she lived her life well. She graduated high school, went on to college, got married and had children of her own. She tells her story to youth groups 
and tells the young people that fear can be conquered, prayers can be answered, sadness can be healed. All those thunderstorms still get her heart racing. She's learned to work through them and appreciate the rain that comes after the storm. Whatever her reason for being spared no longer matters. She was spared and she's lived her life well since then. She did not let the fear conquer her. She did not pass that fear on to her children. In fact, she did what few would dare to do. She took us camping. Strength and patience are two of her defining characteristics. We all have fear and fear can make us re react quickly and make good decisions. But fear that stays with us can make us anxious and low on self-esteem. A monument was erected immediately to honor the five lives lost that day. And they did decide to keep the campground. They still use Darby for women's camps to this day. And they built cabins and lodges. It's a wonderful, beautiful place. But now there's always a medical person there. And the girls learn first aid as part of their camp week. The girls hike the same hike up to the meadow, up by the wind caves. And they're told the story of the lightning strike of 1951. It's considered hallowed ground now. Young girls are taught to be prepared and make the best of each day. Sandy accepts that attitude. She's lived it for 73 years. Thank you. I'm going to have my friends from Writers Convey come up, and if they will come up and introduce themselves first, we're all going to read, and then we will turn it over to open mic. Thanks. My name is Gail Christensen, and I'm going to read a poem called, But Not Too Late. Can you hear me? Late March, the earth opens her musky lodges, a damp thatch underfoot, and over the secreted villages, the furted trails, the mulch pierced by tiny green spears. And from somewhere, you hear the burble of cranes, ancient duets in the stubble grain, the air keen with wood chips and peat, almost a speak of tea, a dark coffee roasting, almost an incense from pyres in earnest yards and farmsteads, crackling heaps of windshorn branches and withered leaves, brittle weeds and brushwood, little rituals everywhere, all things knowing, and sell a bone to come forth. Even you, though late to wake, late to shake your woolly senses, lately burning to make some kind of dance, like the cranes, some bold leap to cremate all that has broken. Jan Euros. I'm going to read a piece about myself. It's called The Slow Erasure of My Life. I was born on December 30th, 1955 at Camp Zama, just outside of Sagami Hara, Japan. My father was then a captain in the U.S. Army. I arrived three weeks before my due date, making me a tax break for my father. <laughs> he never appreciated that, or for that matter, anything else I did. Alas, that's a topic for another day. I thought a few years ago I had heard that Camp Zama was being shut down or given back to the Japanese government. Upon a Google search to look for the date of that transition, I found that Camp Zama seems to still be an active US military base. That's good news. I can now send over my Jan was born here plaque. <laughs> However, I do not have a valid birth certificate. What I have is an embossed copy. I really don't know what happened to the original. Maybe it sits in some US official US military file. 
Because of that fact, I must be very careful to never let my U.S. passport expire because without a valid birth certificate, I cannot get a brand new one. The time I got my original passport at age, eight, at age 18, it took an army for it to happen. My father, who by then was a general, and a great many men in the State Department had to make this happen. My original name does not exist, except on that missing birth certificate. I married two times, and both times I regrettably took on my husband's last name as my own. Growing up in a military family, most of my homes, 15 of them, we moved a lot, were on U.S. Army bases. As of today, a lot of those bases are being renamed because they were originally bestowed names of military heroes who happened to have fought for the South during the U.S. Civil War. Therefore, those addresses have effectively been erased. One of my greatest personal achievements was when I graduated with a bachelor's degree from Utah State University at age 42. I was quite proud that I finally achieved the goal of graduating and with an award of outstanding senior, the grade, not my age, <laughs> in my college. <laughs> However, my diploma is under my first married name, that person doesn't exist anymore, and from the College of Natural Resources, the Department of Geography and Earth Resources, that department doesn't exist anymore either. My body has been partially erased. Besides the standard loss of birth hair, dried umbilical cord plug, and baby teeth, my original body is also missing my hymen, wisdom teeth, my big toenail on my right foot, my tonsils, my thyroid, my uterus and fallopian tubes, and most recently, my gallbladder and my breasts. Plus, my heart has two large fractures from two divorces. I recently retired after 36 years at this one job. A replacement has been hired, but the job title has been changed. My position has been erased. No one stays the same throughout their life. If they did, there'd be no growth or achievement. I like to think that even though I am a different person altogether than I was before, that I have evolved and not been erased. Maybe what was expunged was necessary to get me to the place where I am today. Can you hear me? Is it loud enough? My name is Lisa Duskin Gaby, and I'm really happy to be here to share some of my writings. And my husband died in 2020, and so I have three love poems just about different phases of our marriage. And then the last piece is a short piece about young love. So they're all love stories. And um, the first poem is about um, our adventures out on Airport Road, out in the Benson area, that we would, we would spend a lot of time there and had a lot of fun photographing um, animals and grasses and observing nature. And that, that depicts some really fun times we had together. It's called Along the Road in Seasons. The long, low shadows of November. There's a horse without a tail. There's a mouse quivering in a beer can. Trash in the ditch banks. There's a good luck horseshoe hanging upside down on a fence post. There's a skunk at the turnaround and a raccoon in the cattails. Things that glow in the setting sun, haystacks and seed heads, or tall grasses swishing in the breeze. Meet me, my love, at Old Gnarly, across from Three Snakes. Okay. Human Rights Day. There he sits again, watching placidly at the front window. Come, come look, he says. What now, I think? Engaged in the tactics of my day. The American flag shifts softly in an undetectable breeze. Ice crystals are tumbling through the air. Diamond dust sparkling in the cold sunlight catches his eye and now mine. Oh, I say, how lovely is that? Dear Ron, I ironed your handkerchiefs today. They needed it, you see. Needed the hot crease, the neat fold to be placed in the top, in the top drawer of your dresser. Even though one won't be pocketed anymore in the right-hand side of your trousers, 
Even though hot soup won't give you the sniffles or a sad movie make you cry. Even though it doesn't matter, who would know if your handkerchiefs are left wadded up in the laundry? I ironed your handkerchiefs today because I was your wife. I'm not done. All right. And this was my self-appointed duty as your companion. No tears or sniffles appear on your face in those last few days, only mine. Okay, on a lighter note, <laughs> a long distance love at 14, 1966. Dear Lisa, I wrote the first letter about seven hours ago and it's now 3 a.m. I just got off work an hour ago and I've been thinking about you for a million years, it seems. I love you so much and you're the first girl I ever loved and the first girl I ever said I loved. After I write this letter, maybe I'll sleep. I don't know or care, I only want you, just you. 27 hours ago, we said goodbye and shook hands. Well, now I can only shake hands with a pen, say goodnight to a wall, and love you from 40 miles away. I'm still thinking, writing, hoping I'll see you soon. The pen's cold, your hands were warm and the walls don't talk, and you probably think I'm crazy. Well, I am with love, and our love is, so, is strong, so we will never part by someone else's choice. This letter's beginning to sound confused, even to me now, but I can't stop writing. I have to think of a way to tell you I love you, but in a different way, because this letter is starting to sound old. But I can't think of another way. I'm sorry, I only know the old way. I love you with all my heart. Well, the storm is over, except for small sprinkles. My love is still storming me, and I won't stop thinking of you when I stop writing this letter. I never will. With all the love I can offer, Richard. In a telephone booth now. Hate this once a month shit. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carol Folk, and I write all kinds of different things. Most of my poems, though, are rhyming poems, so they're not quite as deep as some of them, but here we go. The name of this is Strangers in the Street, on the street. Each day is a gift we should count as a blessing. If we stop the rushing, we might observe what we're missing. Our lives are geared to live a fast pace. We barely take time to see face to face. Would a glance with a smile be hard to share just to let someone know we see them there? A man in a hurry pushes on by, leather shoes, a suit and a tie, a perfect business dress, he, his surroundings don't matter. His world is focused on building success. A couple huddles closely together, voices whispering low, with thoughts and secrets they don't want strangers to know. A young boy, red eyes swollen, a face lacking expression. Heavy thoughts weigh him down. Today he fights depression. A group of girls pass giggling and sharing their stories of boys. It's good to hear such a cheerful noise. Their age holds innocence and good times for sharing. With a spring in their steps, there's no time for caring. Wrapped in a tattered coat and ragged old clothes, walks a man defeated with the weight of a war he fought years ago. Faded words on a misshapen that hat, misshapen hat, that sits crooked on straggling hair. If you enjoy your freedom, thank a veteran is the message he wears. Passers-by look away as if not to see. Who do they notice most and, hardest, and try hardest not? Is it him or me? An old couple holds hands moving slower each day. To each day. Do they wish for moments they let slip away? Has time pushed past them like strangers on the street? Do they look back on moments ignored, lost in a heartbeat? If we stop the rushing, we might observe what we're missing. I'm Peggy Newber and I've been writing my life story um, by essay or by 
you know, whatever, whatever I think of. I have a whole box of uh, momentums from my childhood, like uh, report cards from elementary school and letters and photos. And I'm trying to get it all organized and make my life story. But I didn't want to say Peggy Mitchell was born July 6, 1949. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to start it that way. Really boring. So this is what this is what I'm doing. It's doing an essay. This is called Putting Food By. I smell the ripening peaches in the basket by my door. Carol Lee, a good friend from work, was kind enough to pick them up in Brigham City yesterday on her way home from Lagoon. The peaches have a yummy, summery smell. Sometimes I ask myself, why did I decide to can peaches when I have a million other things that need my attention today? Well, one reason is that they are in surplus this fall. The price is fairly reasonable, and I have only three quart jars of peaches left over in the fruit room from the summer before. I'll get them done. Peaches don't take long, and when I see all those jars lined up on the kitchen counter filled with golden peaches, I will feel satisfied and safe. As Greg Brown sang in his song, canned fruit, my grandma took summer and put it all up in a jar. I love looking at my canned food. In fact, I leave it out on the, the kitchen counter long after it should be taken downstairs to store. I leave it out on the, uh, I wonder if mom's canned food gave her as much pleasure. She seemed all business at the time because for her, preserving food was a major undertaking. I mean, she did peaches in gallon jars. And when we did applesauce, it wasn't a mere 20 quarts or so. It was more like 150 quarts. In September, every day when we came home from school, we helped with canning. Our jobs were varied, slipping the peach and tomato skins after they'd been scalded, turning the handles of the Victoria strainer for applesauce, bringing armload after armload of empty jars from the basement to be washed and filled with produce. I remember sitting at the kitchen table, peach juice dripping off my elbows while I peeled the skins from the peaches. I felt all itchy and grumpy that I had to help. Mom would remind us of the story of the little red hen but that didn't make me any more cooperative. My favorite job was turning the Victoria strainer to make applesauce. The simmered, softened apples were scooped into the hopper. Then we cranked the handle and down the tray came the whole perfectly squished up. The magic part was that the seeds, peels, and stems came out the other end. Meanwhile, juice dribbled out of the handle where it attached to the body. Mom always put the bucket below so we wouldn't have a juice lake on the floor of the kitchen. As it was, our kitchen was turned into a sticky mess. Juice or applesauce splashing on the fronts of the cabinets, tables and chairs with specks of fruit clinging to them, and a very sticky floor. It was a good thing we had a washable, we had washable linoleum. I'm sure it was a huge cleanup job, but mom never complained about the mess. She was just glad for the help. Those were long days for her. She canned all days, all day while we were at school, grabbed us to help her when we arrived home and was up late into the night processing the jars to seal them. Even when she had two water bath canners going or two pressure canners going, there was still a backlog of jars to be finished. It was a long and difficult work, but oh, did we ever have a magnificent fruit room. I remember peaches, pears, tomatoes, apricots, apricot nectar, green beans, mustard pickles, chili sauce, beets, applesauce, apple butter, raspberries, corn, carrots, raspberry jam, and even canned meats like chicken and beef stew meat. I'm talking serious canning. <laughs> With this legacy, I can't imagine a fall without canning. Mom has been giving a, Mom has been giving away her empty glass jars to the next gener generation of canners. 
I have friends that never had this experience in training and look upon it as a total mystery. For me, it's as routine as making the bed. Thanks, for, thanks mom for teaching by example. And I forgot, I didn't say it this at first, but we had 14 children in our family. So we can, we can all the time. And that's what we ate. We ate from the basement jars. Anyway, thank you. This is a piece from Alexa West. ABCs for the new year. Accept differences. Be kind. Count your blessings. Dream. Express thanks. Forgive. Give freely. Harm no one. Imagine more. Jettison anger. Keep confidences. Love truly. Master something, nurture hope, open your mind, pack lightly, quell rumors, reciprocate, seek wisdom, touch hearts, understand, value truth, serescape, yearn for peace, zealously support a worthy cause. And now we're ready for our open mic. Each reader will have up to seven minutes to read. After seven minutes, you will be politely clapped off. <laughs> if you don't want to be recorded for YouTube, let us know before you read so we can turn off the camera. And I wanted to remind everybody to re be really careful with your coffee and your drinks today in our brand new library room. Our first three readers are Ronald Jensen, followed by Tim Keller and Elaine Wilcox. Thanks. decided to do this until Star told me I had to. So, <laughs> um, I've noticed over the years that I've been writing that uh, there's a really unfair situation that has arisen. Women seem to be able to write male characters just fine, but men can't write women characters. It's terribly, terribly unfair. I've written a women character. Hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, here we go. This is an excerpt from a, from a longer piece. <clears throat> Penny Mitchell woke, her head pounding, her breath sour, already was hot. The morning sunlight blazed through the car window, mocking her with its brilliance. She was astonished to find herself parked on the bank of a river and stared accusingly at the two-lane highway that must have brought her there before falling back to a dream state. Following events like tangents and reeling herself back to reality like one of Jack's fishing lures. They'd been nearing the end of Jason's college road trip four schools in two days and having reached the level of exhaustion born of the 1,500 miles traversed when her husband and teenage son had cranked the radio 
tilted their heads back and sang at the top of their lungs, so now I'm praying for the end of time. <laughs> Hurry up, man alive. If I have to spend another minute with you, I don't think I could really survive. <laughs> Need love. There's a relationship role model. <laughs> she did a double take, searched their faces for any trace of irony or mirth, and finding none, quite the opposite it seemed to her. She knew it was silly reacting so strongly to a silly song, but couldn't seem to shake it off. In fact, the more she tried, the angrier she got. The moment they arrived at home, she grabbed her keys or purse, stormed out the door. She remembered bits and pieces of the drive from their house, down the hill, through the city, and the relief merging of uh, merging her Prius into traffic. She set the cruise control and settled in right behind in the right hand lane. Car after car whizzed by, most drivers wore expressions of blank determination like drones, slaves to a life they'd once killed themselves they would once have killed themselves to avoid. A shocking number broke with children not wearing their seatbelts, jumping around in the cabin. How can you ignore the safety of your children? she yelled. <clears throat> More pets where all, you know, even pets were better behaved. It was the young couples in their crossovers who bothered her the most, full of hope and affection and debt. It's all fake, she shouted. An illusion, a trap. You'll see, one day you'll end up in, but was it an illusion? Or was it her? Just then a cowboy hat and a red Dodge Ram drove past so close and so fast her Prius rocked with the force of it, almost of its own accord. Her middle finger stood to express her disapproval. <laughs> but the truck was already too far away for her slender finger to be seen. That's it, she yelled, jamming her foot on the accelerator. For its part, Prius responded by switching from electric to gas power. <laughs> Several bells and whistles and lights warned of the impending, if not exactly prompt, environmental disaster, not to mention the need for actual fuel, which should, should she persist. I said, go, damn you, go! And with the most gentle of pushes, the needle began to climb. 78, 80, 83, until at last the red dot on the horizon began to take shape. Cowboy hat? Check. She might have known it would have a Trump sticker. Classy. <laughs> he was nearly in her clutches when, like an escaping squid, the monster released a foul plume of oily black smoke and raced away. She imagined he felt an alarm, a chill, or rivulet of sweat. That's right, she said. Don't slow down, don't even look back. And then imagining however fleeting, or, <clears throat> and the imagining however fleeting felt good, but it was a lie. The billows of Visa's smoke proved that had he thought about her at all, it was just to make her the better for joke. She wakened again, sun blazing, heat in the car was a press over the dam of some wacko rapping on her window. She sat up slowly, trying with that success to rub the blur from her eyes. I'm up, she croaked, I'm up. The knock came again, ma'am, came the young man's voice, strong, tremulous, unbearably earnest. It's awful hot, are you okay in there? Yeah, she croaked, fumbling in vain for the switch to roll down the window. She'd never been an easy rider under even the best of circumstances. Fine, must have fallen asleep in the... And then she woke, really woke this time, her eyes darting from the shadow outside her window, growing familiar surroundings. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but if you don't answer, we're gonna have to break the window. Um, she's not a colleague, said another, said another. Maybe check and see if it's locked first. <laughs> she's not answering the voice shed. We should get an ambulance. Ambulance. The word sounded funny in its unadultery. Its undulations reverberating through her sleep addled mind. Ambulance. <laughs> ambulance? No, she cried. Fine for the door handle. Really, thanks for your damn door. Really, really, I'm fine. Her hand down. <laughs> Slid the, 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 the catch, slid the lock button like it owed her money. The door swung open without warning, taking her with it until the seatbelt yanked her back into place. <laughs> she gazed up at an angel, naked, but for a pair of worn denim shorts with wavy blonde hair, almost too long and flawless skin so thought his entire body appeared to ripple when he moved. Um, hi, he said. His voice quavered and stood stiffly. He looked upward at an angle as if observing a passing airplane. Is everything okay? He looked like a cross between a surfer and a legionnaire. At least that's how it appeared now. She knew who, at least now she knew who the Knox belonged to, and he wasn't alone. There were shadows and titters from the peanut gallery. She felt it then, a little too much ventilation in her blouse. She had loosened things up, as it were, to get some sleep, and now the girls were getting just a little too much exercise. <laughs> Man, he began, wrinkled her blouse. Do you know where you are? 
She laughed, looked like a demi he looked like a demigod, but he sounded like Skippy the Eagle Scout. <laughs> Man, do you know where you are? He asked again. Or do you know who you are? Uh, Penelope Mitchell, she almost added the doctor, but figured it would sound imperious. Besides, her title usually prompted more questions and answers, and ever cautious, she didn't need the cast of the Lost Boys showing up in her life. Sweet, I mean, um, hi, I'm Matthew, and these are Bart and Derek. She nodded politely to each. Oh my God, she thought, just assure them you're okay and go home. Do you know what day this is, Matthew asked? Oh, for God's sake. And he scratched her head. Monday? This prompted applause. All right, all right, she said, using a professional settle down voice. Could any of you tell me what time it is? Matthew checked his watch. 2.29. She found that charming. A boy his age without... A phone, her phone, she'd been gone all night, it must be blown up. She turned back to her car, her definitely not Prius, with its definitely dry gas tank, and the rest of her memory came flooding back. Takers? Shannon, please. Our Writers Cafe brought some stickers in the back. If you want to take one home, it's pretty cool. And thanks to our in-house graphic artist, Gail. Thanks, oh, sorry. Graphic Gail. artist, Gail. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shannon Bowen. I'm just going to read one poem tonight. It's called The Flowers. The Flowers. In fifth grade homeroom, they strummed, they strummed their ukuleles, music pouring like sunlight into Scud's ears as he sang in his cleanest voice, where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyard, every one. On the way home from school, a pink star five petal stared back at Stubbs with its one brave eye. Stubbs fell to his knees in the mud and rubbed his lips against the leathery leaves, closed his eyes and pretended he was a puppy rubbing his face against the mother dog's belly. Then he rubbed his whole face against it, imagining magenta smearing his face so he looked like a clown or the way his mother's lipstick smeared when she, got, she was drunk. There was something sad and beautiful in the way Grandma smeared the tiny lipstick samples from Avon onto her lips. Princess pink, the color leaping off her, off her pale face like an ember jumping out of the fireplace, or a bat blasting up in the dust, dusk all surprise, or like the shooting star who died before he, his eyes in the velvet flush of night. The smallest deaths are the most awful, Stubbs thought and he remembered bringing to school his sea monkeys for show and tell, holding, holding them in their little tank between his legs on the bus. Over every bump and curve, he clutched them tighter. His teacher, Mrs. Shiazawa, held them by the lid in front of the class so as not to obstruct the view. All the students watched, and then the lit, red lid slid off. Stubbs' heart fell with the sea monkeys. They splatted wet, on the gray classroom carpet. Stubbs clutched the sharp grief in his throat. He forced his brain airtight like the Tupperware lids grandma pressed, lifting the edge to squeeze out every puff of air before she snapped it shut. He wanted to be brave like the tiny magenta flower, like the sea monkeys in their final fall, like the soldiers marching into the cold wind, death breaking their faces. I got a 
Started this a long time ago. Every couple of years, I get reminded of something, bring it back to it. So here we go. It's called Snap. A long war story in just a few words. We were all good guys just a while back. And now, after nine jungle rot months, my last best friend, good guy for longer than most, is snapped. We're near the we're near the edge of nothing named the spell. And from behind us, the sudden nasal sing-song screams of an old villager, grated schizophrenic nerves. Her screams might have been a warning, maybe. Who the hell knows? Who the hell cares? It was Danny World. His M16 scream had shot up. The dead mom saw him bait instantly. And now, everything's quiet. Spooky quiet. Except Danny's crying. The world's axis still is weird. The whole planet wobbles and everybody's going crazy. Nobody's innocent. Nobody's safe. And yeah, I'm getting scared. Anyone else like to read? Thank you. Thank you so much. The next Telecon West is here on Thursday, March 28th, featuring the reading of USU Poetry Slam Team. Please come back and listen to them. I'd like to, to thank Star for all she does and for keeping this going. Joseph for all you do and within the library. All the readers tonight and everyone who came out. I'd like to thank uh, Cafe Agus for the coffee and support. Who am I forgetting, Star? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting me MC tonight. This was great fun. Thank you.